for a long time, it was times. I, I chased times. I chased marathon times. I chased, you know, 50 mm -hmm. mile times, whatever it was. You know, that was, that was big, but at the heart of it, I just love this sport. I love running. I love where it brings me. I love what I see. I love who I meet. I love, you know, the time I spend with people on the trail. Like, I love the places it takes my family and I, the experiences that we have. Hey, Andrew here with Run Elite, and I want you to lock in for this amazing conversation that I had with a runner that you're gonna wanna hear from. His name is Aaron Saft, and he's a good friend of mine. He's a fantastic runner. He's an outstanding business owner, coach, and leader. And uh, when it comes to his running, he's done some things that are very noteworthy. So this guy is national champion in the trail marathon, 2007. He's East Coast all champion in uh, cross country, indoor track, outdoor track, back in college. Aaron is attempting right now the grand slam of 100 mile races, which is four 100 mile races, back to back to back to back. And we're gonna hear about the journey from going from track and marathon and the, going for the time and getting the competitive nature into becoming a mature ultra runner who's looking beyond the time on the clock. Like what else is there in there? And how does it enrich a life? So without further ado, I introduce to you Aaron Saft. I hope that you enjoy. Let's go. <laughs> hey Aaron. Hi. How are you, Andrew? <laughs> I'm pretty well. So you're in the middle of quite uh, a feat of ultra running, <laughs> the Grand Slam of 100s, four 100s that are spaced roughly a month apart each. Yeah, and three down. Three down. Yeah, three down. It's been quite a summer. Um, it didn't start off as I anticipated. You know, everybody looks forward to racing Western States, and I was the same. And uh, Western States was a really rough day. I don't know. Um, can't explain much why, but, you know, it just seemed like everything went wrong, and I was just problem solving all day. That said, I, I still had a positive experience because I really enjoyed the course. Um, I enjoyed being out there and just was really grateful for the opportunity. So um, I got the finish and uh, was able to continue the slam. And then the next race was supposed to be three weeks later at the Vermont 100, which uh, was canceled due to all of the flooding, um, which really threw a spin into the Grand Slam. We had to wait about almost 10 days before the Grand Slam told us what to do. So I reached out to Scotty Coomer at 10 Jump Miles, and um, it, it was kind of the advice of one of the other runners that was in the same situation. He had reached out, and Scotty had let him in, so I did the same, and Scotty let me in. Um, there were, I think, three of us uh, that went to the Badger 100, and it starts in Illinois and finishes in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and we did the Badger 100 in, in the place of uh, the Vermont 100, which gave me three weeks to Leadville 100. And I just finished Leadville, just came off of that last weekend. Um, it was a, a beautiful race. I really looked forward to that. Um, it was challenging in so many ways with altitude and um, just trying to beat cutoffs. Uh, it's, you know, it's very much a running race. You have to really run that race, and that's what everybody kept stressing, which created some stresses, you know, there's trying to get through 100 and making sure that you're, you're on time, um, you know, you basically the lowest elevation that you're at is 9,000 feet and you go up over Hope Pass yes. which is over 12,000 feet um, and it's an out and back so you have to go back over Hope Pass <laughs> yep. which was really challenging um, but I'm you know happy to say I finished that one and I'm on to Wasatch which is um, now less than actually it's two weeks from today um, so going to Utah in two weeks to, to race Wasatch for the the finale of the, the slam awesome <laughs> um, when you had to make that shift from Vermont, did they give you a time frame? Like you have to get in a hundred before the mm. official third one? They didn't, uh, they said you could do it anytime this year. Um, but in kind of in the fashion of the grand slam, I wanted it to be done, you know, in the, the time frame that usually is the grand slam, which is over the course of the summer from June to September, beginning of September. So um, I think they were allowing people to do one afterwards. Um, they didn't really quite state. I, I didn't yeah. ask because I was just gonna, you know, try to get it done in that time frame. So mm -hmm. um, there are six of us left out of the seventeen that started the slam. Uh, so uh, Leadville took out three, unfortunately. Uh, there were three DNFs from uh, from Leadville. Leadville had a really bad attrition rate. We were it was a forty four percent finishers rate out of 845 starters. Um, so it's a really big race, like very tough. Yeah, so um, amazing to see. There was um, multiple athletes with um, uh, like 
amputations. So um, I met one of the gentlemen um, above the knee amputation, met another gentleman double above the knee amputation. Um, really amazing stories, you know. Um, unfortunately, wow. neither finished, but, you know, uh, the one was in the lead man, the one with the single leg amputation, and he um, he was in the 100-mile mountain bike race at Leadville the week before doing the Ironman, uh, excuse me, the uh, lead man. And uh, somebody clipped his tire on one of the scents, and he crashed and broke a collarbone. So he was, you know, <laughs> a poor guy. And he was still out there. He's still out there going for it. Yeah, um, it was it was incredible. Like, so many cool stories, you know, just so many really cool runners and stories and very motivating. Um, Ken Kluber had a great, you know, speech at the beginning, which just really resonated with me about, you know, paying your debts, um, which is what got my butt going at halfway point because I sat there and just... A moment of, uh, you know, doubt, I guess, because it was, you know, it was really so much to get over Le- um, Hope Pass. Mm-hmm. I was just exhausted. Um, legs were cramping. Um, fatigue was setting in. And I was just, you know, I was at a low point. And I sat there and, and Ken said, you got to pay your debts. And what he meant by that is, you know, we owe it to um, others that have sacrificed for us to be there. You know, mm-hmm. my, my family the family time it took to train, the finances it took to get there, my crew for their, you know, commitment to me and being there. Like they were waiting for me in Twin Lakes, you know, about 12 miles away. And, you know, when I thought about that and paying my debt, I said, you know, I got to get him out of this chair. It's not going to be me that's going to take myself out of this race. It's going to be if I time out. Um, So I made every effort to get back up and over. Uh, I think I actually ascended back up to Hope Fast faster than I descended <laughs> to the aid station. <laughs> really? um, and so I made up some time and, and I made up a lot of time on the backside, but I think I went a little too hard. So what mile did you approach the ascent each way? So it's about mile um, 42 um, on the way out and then uh, maybe 44. Um, well, no, yeah, it's, hold on, let me think. 38, it's 38, yeah. So it's 38 because it's 12 over to Winfield that's the turnaround point and then 12 back. So, uh, 12, 12 and a half. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite the climb. It's, you gain about 3000 feet over the course of four miles on the way out and then something pretty similar on the way back. So it's, it's pretty intimidating. Um, and it's a lot of two way traffic at that point. That's when the race mm-hmm. leaders start coming back. So it, it's kind of moving aside and you know, it, it really is a lot of disruption. On the way back, uh, probably a little over, maybe half to three quarters of the way back, that I finally saw the last of the runners coming over, and then it was you know kind of clear sailing, so we can kind of concentrate again. It, a lot of times it was just kind of looking up, you know, just making sure you're not in somebody's way. Yeah. Um, and really, like looking up, that almost a thousand feet. Per yeah, mile, yeah. It's know? it's. I mean, it's steep. It really is. And then at that altitude, it was. On the way, um, on the other side, it was hot too. It was, you know, it was, it was pretty hot because it was, you know, just after midday. So it was yeah. a lot of factors there. And everybody was just like, you can tell the people like myself that wasn't as acclimated and, you know, kept having to pull over and I was just drinking off my bladder and, and trying to take some electrolytes and make sure I was okay. You know, just make sure the heart rate didn't get too high. Mm-hmm. Um, Are you and, talking acclimated for the altitude or the Yeah, for, uh, both, for both. both okay. How did you get acclimated for the altitude? Um, I, I really didn't have the opportunity to. I got there Tuesday. You know, people were asking, did you get here early? And I was like, well, Tuesday was the best I could do. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, you know, it's, it's it's hard in the slam because there's, you know, there's so many travel logistics. And it's really hard to sacrifice a lot of time to, you know, to go and, and get acclimated. Um, Utah will be between 5,000 and just under 10,000 is the highest point. We're 9,900 and something feet in, uh, in Wasatch. So, you know, some pretty good altitude there still, um, not as much or not as hard, uh, and you don't say as high as you do in Leadville. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, I was just relying on my fitness <laughs> just to kind of carry me through, mm-hmm. um, and just hoping I was recovered enough from Badger. Um, you know, I could tell my legs were a little tired, you know, they didn't have as much pop as they usually do. And that could have also been attributed to its altitude, but, um, yeah, it was, it, it, overall I was, I was pleased with my ability to, to run as much as I did there and, and get through the course. Um, I was ahead of the 25 hour mark, 25 hour or earned you the big belt buckle. Um, I was ahead of that for a long time up until about hope pass. <laughs> and I was glad I was, cause that's probably the difference in, yeah. you know, what my finish was. Um, did, I they cha- did they change that in the past? What did it used to be a 24? 
Because that's kind of like a standard. Of- yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know the. I mean, they on their website they have a really good history of the race, and I bought a book that's um, a history of the race, and they update it each year with finishing results. So it has like every year. So this year was the 40th anniversary, mm-hmm. which was pretty cool. So I ran the 50th anniversary for Western States and the 40th anniversary. Yeah, for, for Leadville. Perfect so year. Yeah, all, all came cool together. Year. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So, um, but yeah, I don't know if they changed that. Um, the 30 hour cutoff is it's tough. That's a tough cutoff. Um, you know, for a lot of folks. And I was really surprised by how many first timers there were in the race when we went to the pre race meeting and they said, How many first timers do we have? And the amount of hands that went up, I was very yes. surprised because yeah. that's a that's a tough first hundred. Yeah. So But it's got uh aside from Western states in, in the United States, is there I mean, in my head I think that's probably like the second most in demand one. Would you agree? Yeah, uh and there's a few that are growing to be um Know, probably right up there with those. Um, I would probably say that um, High Lonesome is becoming an event that people are, are seeking after. Uh, another Colorado event. Um, and Hard Rock would be another one. Oh, yeah. One. Yeah. All right. So Hard Rock, when you're climbing up Hope Pass and feeling the the deadness in your <laughs> yeah. legs, like at a low point, um, you did Hard Rock just last year, wasn't uh, it? Two years ago. Two years yeah, ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how did that climb compare? compare because you got more pre-fatigue going into this yeah. one yeah um hard rock was you know the nice thing about hard rock is the cutoffs are so lenient <clears throat> you have yeah. like 40 plus hours to finish that one mm-hmm. um and so it wasn't as stressful and i think that's what the combination was was just in the back of my mind just making sure that you know i was going to get in under that 30 hour cutoff for lead bill so it was it felt more pressing um, whereas Leadville, or excuse me, Hard Rock, I just felt like I could, you know, take my time. At, like I knew I was fine on time. Like you know, I was well ahead of everything. So like I didn't feel that stress. But it, it like during Leadville, I think everybody kind of felt that stress. There wasn't a lot of chatter like you normally find in hundred milers. Like people didn't want to talk. They wanted to focus. There wasn't a lot of headphones. Um, you know, everybody was really intent on their race and focused on their race, which rightly so it, it was, you know, it was one of those races where if you took your mind off of it, you could be wasting some time. You know, if you weren't focused on what was going on, you could slow yourself down just because you weren't doing what you needed to do. So mm-hmm. I didn't wear headphones. Um, you know, you could, you couldn't pick up a pacer until you got back to twin lakes, which was mile 68. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you could have a pacer to the finish. Uh, which was really nice because, like I said, it was just so quiet. I mean, you know, there's people around, but like I said, you know, a lot of people just didn't want to, you know, talk for long. And, and, you know, we were all doing different things. We all had our own race strategies. So it was, you'd stay with somebody for a little while and then they would disappear, <laughs> you know, so. Okay. Wow. Um, I had hiked to that um, about 10 years ago, uh, the Colorado Trail hmm. and going over Hope Pass. And sure. I remember this one moment where, I didn't run while I was out hiking for like four weeks, but I got to this point where I looked at a map and saw it was right around in Leadville. There was like this water supply, like a little lake that was two miles down this hill. Mm-hmm. So I thought I'm going to take my pack off and run. I haven't run in like three weeks and I feel good. Like altitude, what? And I took my pack off and, and ran down this two mile stretch that was like, okay. Cause it was downhill and thought I could run back up and just like insanely gassed. <laughs> like I'd never been before just because of that altitude and not being used to it. So going up to 14,000, like multiple times in a hundred, um, I can like barely imagine what that's like, but, uh, recovery from those, it, it's like listening to, to you here. It sounds like that one is kind of like where it's like starting to get, mm-hmm. not that it wasn't real before, but mm-hmm. like recovery is kind of like major right now. And that yeah, really took a absolutely. lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And I went to go see, uh, Miriam Sloom yesterday. Yep. Um, muscles were definitely, um, the source they have been uh, and i attributed that to that descent off of hope pass um i was really trying to get in before dark um i had watched a youtube video from um hella he's a, a you know kind of a youtube <laughs> sensation um awesome runner he did western states this year as well um but he had a video it was his first hundred it was leadville and i had watched his video and just to kind of get a sense for timing and aid stations and he got back to Twin Lakes um, from coming down Hope Pass in the dark, and I wanted to get back just before that 
because he was set up really well for the finish. And I was like, all right, you know, if I can get just before that, I'll be set up really well for the remainder of this race. So that was my goal, was getting down um, without having to turn and my head And this was the off. first or second time? This was the second time. Okay. So coming down, so that four-mile descent of 3,000 feet of drop, yeah. I was booking. And okay. I think that's what really, you know, got my, my quads. I felt it, like, mile 90, my quads were like, well, we don't want to run right now. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it became a challenge at the end of the race, and that, that's what I felt the most. So I saw Miriam yesterday, my physical therapist, and, mm-hmm. you know, we went through things, and you know, she kind of just combed through the muscles and kind of made sure everything was, was good, and they feel much better better today um i did some some good movement yesterday with my cross-country kids we did some mobility stuff and i did it with them and feel much better so just doing some walking right now um just trying to you know create that mobility and kind of flush the muscles out and just get the blood so ever pumped. since leadville mm-hmm. it's been just walking recovering and walking mm-hmm. yeah. how about leading up for the next two weeks um just listening to your body yeah listening to my body um you know it's i have uh, a coach in patrick reagan and he um he said this this next one we just recover you know whatever the body needs and you know i communicate that more to him and just say you know not ready (laughs) or you know i'm good so usually i mean what it's what i've typically seen is about 10 days and my body's ready to run again um i've done seven and i can tell i'm not quite there yet um able to run but the paces are much slower and so it's about 10 days where my paces start to get back down to normal um seeing that in hrv too (laughs) looking at hrv scores i can see like you know recovery scores it's about 10 days so that rule of thumb that a lot of people say you know take a day for every 10 miles you raced it's it's pretty pretty close (laughs) so uh, this month may take me a little bit longer uh, and I'm okay with that. Um, as I was telling you, I've got a trip to Italy, so um, mm-hmm. it's you know I'll be I'll be happy to just run around the Amalfi Coast <laughs> and enjoy the scenery. Um, there's not much obviously fitness I'm going to gain um, in this next few weeks, so it's just kind of maintenance yep. um, and not overdoing it <laughs> is the big thing. You know, just trying to stay healthy. Um, I don't feel anything right now that's problematic that I'm worried like oh you know I got to be careful about this. Uh, you know, like even though, uh, like I said, I had some cramping and stuff like that, the, the needling yesterday really helped kind of get me going again. Yeah. Um, muscles feel pretty good. So we're getting there. Yep. Okay. Uh, so physically, um, you know, you've run 200 miles even. So I, I have confidence in you that you can just hammer it out physically. <laughs> but if we bring it back to the mental and then even a step before that into like the emotional, are you looking forward to being at the tail end of this and having like the next one be the celebration. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not looking through it. I'm looking at it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, each one has its own challenges, and they've all presented something unique. Um, you know, Leadville obviously they had some really unique challenges, and, and Utah will as well. Um, it's like Utah's going to be the most temperature swing. Um, daytime could be 90 nighttime could be 30 or below um, so it's you know it's got a lot of challenges for gear and um, the other part of, of Wasatch is that crew access points are very limited there's two in the first half and one in the second half um, so the, you know it'd be a lot of drop bags and reliance on drop bags which is fine <clears throat> I'm prepping for that um, but you know looking at each of those parts and trying to analyze what I'll need and you know what to uh i guess you know estimate <laughs> uh what's what's it gonna you know it take at that point what do i need and you know do i need certain gear do i need certain food um so just prepping for that is you know that's, that's a challenge too um yeah looking at it and saying what do i need to succeed um and then yeah it's it's exciting it's the last one um it, it, we have 36 hours for this one mm-hmm. um it's you know it is a, a hiker's course there's a lot more vertical gain this one has the most vert of any of the ones i've done uh, which is my favorite <laughs> yeah so i look forward to that part of it um so yeah it's it's gonna be a neat one <laughs> uh what's the gain on this one? Oh, this one <clears throat> i think it's 20 it's around 25 um i'd have to look up the exact number but it's it's around twenty five thousand. okay um I'd like to hear a little bit about your training, especially the, with ultras. I mean, if you look at some of the great ultra uh, 
I'm thinking of contrasting Camille Heron and Giannis Kuru right now with their long runs. Mm. And, you know, Camille, she does regular 20 mile runs, I think every like 10 day cycle or so, but pretty high volume, but not long runs that are like crazy long unless she's racing Mm -hmm. versus Giannis who would do like never more than, I think he said like 12 K in a session, but would race huge races like pretty frequently. So the difference between high mileage with sort of long, long runs Mm -hmm. or very long, long runs. Mm -hmm. Um, What have you found his, and not just with the Grand Slam, but over the last like several years or so Yeah. uh, in your training, can you talk about comparing those two? Sure. Um, So let me preface this by saying I'm going on 46. (laughs) So my training has evolved to understand that my body can't withstand a lot of the volume I used to do. Um, I've recognized that doing too much volume or too much intensity with volume, my body won't recover as quickly. Um, So what I've done is that if the focus is on volume, then I focus on volume. And Mm -hmm. it's my long runs. Um, I've, you know, I had, I think my longest, I had, I had to do a 50 mile qualifier for, um, Vermont. So that was the furthest I went in training. Now, would I have done that 50 mile or otherwise? I'm not sure. Um, I don't think I would have needed it. Um, I feel comfortable in my endurance capacity. So when people look at what they're, what they're doing during training is how comfortable do they feel with their endurance? Um, and that's something I often ask my, you know, my, my runners, like, do you feel confident that you are okay with, you know, doing distance? Do you feel you need that physically and mentally? Is it worth it to take that time to do it and recover from it? Um, and like I said, you know, that 50 miler, I had to do it on, well, <laughs> in retrospect, I didn't have to do it cause Vermont didn't happen, but <laughs> yeah. um, in order to have my entry there, I did. So, um, but I did a 50 K in training. And I think 50K for me is about all I would have needed uh, prior to Western States. Um, just one 50K and then the rest, I'm like Camille, um, I would do a 20 miler every now and again. Um, I'm comfortable with, you know, just going out for a 20 miler and, and doing that, you know, and not, it doesn't have to, you know, I like Western States, it was an interesting training because of all the downhill. So we tried to make it so that there was a good amount of up and a good amount of down in, you know, my training runs. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, but, um, but overall, no, I don't think, um, I don't think high volume is as, as necessary as, as a lot of people make it. Uh, I think some people overdo it too frequently and that's what leads them to fatigue and overtraining. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's very sensible to understand yourself and where you're at and how you're feeling and be honest with that. Um, if your paces are slowing down, especially look at your volume and intensity. Are you doing too much? Uh, those are good questions to ask. Uh, I noticed I was slowing down in my paces and I, you know, I said to my coach, I said, Hey, my paces are getting slower. I'm getting, you know, tired and not recovering as quickly. Let's diminish some of the intensity that we have and just focus on the aerobic. Cause uh, you know, I, I think we're just trying to do too much. Um, so we pulled away from intensity in my training. Um, and just refocused on the aerobic part of it. And that's when I started getting my paces back down. Um, so I, you know, and again, we reduce volume as well, just to kind of make sure I was recovering. Um, and then in between Western States and Badger is where I really started to find my paces coming back down. Um, and I felt really comfortable again at some of the paces that I hadn't seen in a while. So I think I needed that recovery. I may have been overtrained for for Western. I think the block was just too long. Um, so I think I was going at it for for too much time. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a a big background of running. You've been running most of your life. You ran in college. Mm-hmm. You ran in high school too. I did. Yeah. Um, so I think Frank Shorter said something like this: like that. Um, well, he says consistency is key, which we've heard before. But like over the long term, like over decades. And he told an, an amazing story a couple years ago where he went into all of his training logs and he just added up all the miles and divided it by the total amount of days for like 20 years and got a number that was like something like 18 or something every day for 20 years. And um, it seems like when you ask your runners, how comfortable are you with your endurance, that 
perhaps it comes more, I mean, would you think that it comes more from uh, what you've done over your lifetime and not as much as what you've done over this season or even the last like two or three seasons? But like if you ran high volume for 10 years, now you kind of maybe don't need to and you can do those bigger runs or even possibly vice versa. It's like they're two components yeah. and you can't really build both at the same time. Right. So that's where longevity Yes. Really yeah. Comes in. Yeah. So looking at a runner's history is is really significant, especially in ultra. You know how comfortable have they been over the long term with high volume? You know, uh, like what and what is their history with ultra? Right? Are they new to it? Are they experienced mm-hmm. with it? Um, because you know those that are are more experienced with it, like they're they're the ones that like they tend to overdo it <laughs> because they've been at it for so long. And they're the ones yeah. that are like, you know, I'd like I want to do 400s this year. And, you know, it becomes more of a point of recovery rather than finding a training cycle. Um, so, um, yes, looking at the overall picture and their history, I think is a bigger piece of the pie. Um, those that are more new to ultra and new to running, then they may need a little bit more endurance and, you know, you may have to be a little bit more creative with their training patterns, uh, not just kind of throwing a 50 miler in there because you want to force something so they have that experience. Yeah. It may just be, okay, so over the course of, you know, this week, we're going to try to include some bigger runs and that may include a 50K and a 30K that we break up over the course of the week, depending on their, you know, obviously their life schedule. Um, but I would rather see them, you know, do a bigger volume week than one single volume run so they they get the experience they get the volume but they don't get as much fatigue either um a lot of times i find that the newer runners if i have them go out and just do a a 40 or 50 mile run it takes them a lot longer to recover from yep and we waste a lot of training time i don't want to say waste but we let them recover so that we don't get them injured or tired so you know, looking at the bigger picture and their history is, I think it's, it's huge. Yeah. I see this with, uh, people who are doing their first 50 K or the first 50 mile or the first hundred. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's this belief that if I've only done a marathon, I've got to run a 50 mile before I run a hundred. And so they like want to push and do that 50, but there's uh utility in that, I think, but the recovery is like you're saying going to be huge, but also there's like something magical in ultras where it's like, what is the limit? You can go a hundred, you can go 200. You, I mean, how far can you yeah, go? Right. So if you run the 50 and that's your first one, it's probably going to be the hardest run you've ever done. And then it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, can I really do double that? <laughs> and so I think sometimes staying away from those, those runs that you think you have to do because it's a stepping right. stone and just hurtling right over them and you can just go. And right. in, in some ways, the longer stuff, can be easier than the shorter stuff just because of the pace and we do a lot of time-based training um so that they don't get wrapped up in a number that's mileage um and like especially if it's trail running i don't want them to feel like you know uh, gotta go out for a 20 mile run this is going to take me like you know six plus hours like that's a lot of time you know a lot of time on feet like i'd rather them just say all right i'm gonna go out for a four hour run and you know whatever it is it is like i'm gonna spend four hours on my feet a lot of times that works out better, um, mm-hmm. for, especially for my trail runners, because they're not as fo- you know they're not as focused on a distance, and they're getting that time on feet. They're still getting good stress, you know, good training adaptation. So, um, and I don't have to recover as much. So it's it, it works out a lot of different ways, you know. And they will say, well, you know, like uh, my longest run is, but you know, your longest run was also whatever this many hours. Like mm-hmm. you spent that much time on your feet. Your body knows like what that feels like to be on your feet for that long. So, and it's probably at an intensity that was much faster than what they're actually going to do in an actual race. And probably flat track. too. Right? Mm-hmm. right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, that's my favorite thing about doing a long run based off of time is I feel licensed to be able to just go up and down hills and get like no miles, but lots of vert. And Absolutely. if you're trying to satisfy the log book, you can't really satisfy the vert nearly as much. And for races like this, yeah. that really matters. And it's, it's, I mean, Strava kind of creates that too, right? Like they worry what's going to post, you know, like what's going to be on there. And, and that's, that's something we talk about too, is just kind of getting over Strava and yeah. getting over what your numbers say, like on there, it's, it's, you know, people look at, it, they're going to like it either way. <laughs> yeah. Scroll, scroll, like, yeah. scroll. Yeah. yeah. They're not really worried about like how far did you go? <laughs> yeah. They're probably worried about how far they went. Right. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Strava game, uh, I mostly have stayed away from that. I'm on it now. Um, I haven't logged into it in months. It just linked with my Koros. Right. But it was an issue. Uh, I only got on Strava because there was a local vertical challenge <laughs> for a month. And I'm like, oh, that's fun. And I was training for Tahoe at the time. Yeah. So it's like, let's get in some vert. And I started cranking with the vert like <laughs> never before. And things were going really well. And um, I was like getting on there daily, looking at the ranks. And it's like, oh, I'm number two. Oh, I'm number one. Oh, I'm number three. Oh. And getting competitive. And then going out and doing kind of stupid stuff, like not even running. I just want to get the vert. So there's this nice hill right here. Right. And I would go out in the evening and put an audio book on and just walk up and down the hill. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of fun. Until a mile, like uh, until week, like three, three and a half, and I was out on like an easy run with a friend in Black Mountain, and there was this like incredible pain uh, behind my ankle oh. that I never felt before, and um, slowed down a little bit. I had to let him go and hobble in, and I strained my tibialis posterior oh, no. like really bad. Went on crutches for a couple days after that, uh, three weeks off, and luckily I was able to come back and keep training. But that dang injury, it like. It reared its head like a month ago, and this was like a year and a half ago, and it came from my. It came from the vertical challenge, but the vertical challenge was like this thing that I was trying to do on Strava, and it ended up. If I could change like one thing in the last five years of my training, I mean, I don't really want to change anything, but you know, hypothetically, um, I wouldn't do that again. Like get on these challenges. Um, they're kind of fun, but they are. They are. Maybe save it for the race or something. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. Uh, I know it's it's difficult because there's all the the segments and people want the crowns and they chase yeah. the crowns or see how you know they can pr you know they could be good challenges and and sometimes when people are when they're i don't want to say obsessed but when they you know they're really interested in those things i may include it in like a workout and just say hey you know let's do this and then you can chase the segment during this workout you know because it so serves multi multi-purpose mm -hmm. um I don't do it too often, but it, I know some of those people are like, you know, they're really into Strava and, you know, it means a lot to them. Yeah. Um, so I try to include those things when I can. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I, I, I don't, I don't really do much with Strava myself. Um, I use training peaks with my athletes, so I'm on a platform mm -hmm. <laughs> enough <laughs> that yeah. I don't really want to spend a ton of time on another platform doing something very similar. Um, it's not that I don't want to see what my friends are up to. I can always search them and see, you know, what they've been doing, how they're doing, or I can just text them or call them <laughs> and say, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, it, you know, I, I understand the platform. It is a cool social, um, tool, you know, um, and it is a good way to kind of track your own. It's a good way to have a training log, a digital training log and kind of record your thoughts. And, and so there is value to it, mm -hmm. but I do think some people use it the wrong way. Mm hmm yeah, it's got that kind of longevity. It's been around for a while. Yeah. Um, years ago, I switched. I used to run with the Garmin. Then I worked for TomTom Tom for a while and mm -hmm. use that now. Koros. So my training logs, they're like this platform. And I got to log into yeah. what's my Garmin password <laughs> from 10 years ago. But right. there it is on Strava. Just go back. And it's, yeah. it's I, I keep it for that reason too. It's just like keeping track, just a log. Um, right. But that's, that's kind of about it. Um, how have you found sleep to be critical in in the times between of course like more sleep good mm -hmm. but i'm wondering how much sleep you actually are kind of getting mm -hmm. i find that even with serious runners they get like little sleep oftentimes mm -hmm. and if you can like really up it i, I yeah. see elite runners sleeping almost ubiquitously i wrote about this in here as well um these are marathoners mostly and some ultra marathoners who really are sleeping 11 or 12 hours a day and it's like eight or nine at night mm -hmm. plus a nap mm -hmm. because of the high volume sure but Outside of the the really like elite Olympic level world, I don't really see that that often. So, how does your sleep? Uh, do you try to be? Are you very consistent? Yeah. And could you just speak about that? Sure, sure. Um, my kids just started school again, so um, you know it, it creates a habit for me. Um, my daughter has been getting to bed at nine, which is fantastic, and my son, we try to get him in bed, you know, by ten. But usually, it's my wife that puts him to sleep because she can go to bed later. Um, just because she has the <laughs> the capacity I, I i'm pretty tired by uh 9 30 10 o'clock so i try to be you know in bed laid down by 10 each night and try to you know sleep usually um our alarms go off at 6 a.m so i try to get eight hours um during the night 
uh, sometimes, like this morning, I naturally woke up at like 5.15 and my body was just awake. So I usually get somewhere between seven and eight hours a night. In the afternoon, if just before practice, if I'm sleepy, I'll probably get a 20 to 30 minute nap um, if I need it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Some days that doesn't work out and some days I don't need it. But um, on, on average, seven to eight hours plus maybe like a 20 to 30 minute nap. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's pretty consistent. Uh, I'm a big believer of getting the same pattern each night, going to bed at the same time each night, which is, it's tough when you travel, obviously, like when I went to Colorado, that's a two hour time change and Utah will be the same and then six hours to, in Italy. So, um, that's going to be disruptive and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do what I can to, to still get my eight hours and it's going to be difficult to come back and then switch into the East time zone for a night yeah. and then go to the <laughs> mountain standard for, uh, you know, the next few. So, so that's going to be like, is that an eight hour difference then? Like yeah. Popping over yeah. Like, yeah. Yikes. So it's going to be, right. it's going to be, that's going to be a challenge. Um, but sleep is, it's vital. Um, when I was, let's see, it was 20, 2022 was the last year I did Hellbender as the RD and I was trying to do my coaching. I was trying to train. Um, I was trying to um, coach at the high school level, uh, be a dad, be a husband, um, and uh, and get ready for Hellbender. You know, prep for getting Hellbender put on. So my my attentions were everywhere. I found myself opening. You know, kind of getting up about four a.m. each morning going to bed at 10 getting up at four so i was getting maybe six hours some nights it was even worse like i'd have to stay up later to get other stuff done um and i started noticing a decline in my performance everywhere mentally physically uh, it was just i i knew i was burning the candles at both ends and i was doing my detriment to myself but i had no other choice unfortunately because of how much i had on my plate and that's what made me realize I was trying to do way too much and had to give up Hellbender because it was just, you know, as much as I loved putting it on, it was just too much for me. And, it, you know, it, it, it created too much stress, um, you know, mentally, physically, um, and just put too much demand on, on me. So um, this year, uh, without having to put on Hellbender, it was infinitely better. I was able to not have to get up so early, not have to do so much. Um, and my, my life stress was so much better. My training was better. So, um, yeah, I mean, high school coaching is still a tough demand. It's, you know, two to six each night. So four hours of my day was high school training. Um, when did you start that? Uh, training the high school kids? Yeah. Um, I've been between, I started the middle school, um, probably, five years ago yeah I started training at the middle school it was about five years ago and then I switched over to the high school um, last year for track um, so between the um, you know those guys here um, I, you know I, I trained high schoolers previously but here it was I started with middle school about five years ago middle school is you know a lot less commitment which like our cross-country practice goes from like 3 to 4 30. Um, but the high school, it's like, I got to get there and set things up and get things ready and then obviously clean things up. So it takes a little bit more time with the, the track. Um, and the, uh, the new commitment was winter track doing winter track with the kids. So it was winter and spring. Um, I think the balance is I get so much joy out of it. You know, it's like, it's such a, a great part of my day. Uh, I look forward to it. You know, it's, it's a positive, positive piece of life even though there's a lot to it, you know, there's a lot of moving parts and mm-hmm. running a, a track team and, um, coaching all these athletes, uh, it, but it's, it's something I enjoy. So, uh, continue to do it. <laughs> so in a way you've taken, I mean, you were busy with super busy with hellbender and everything else that you just said, but now, I mean, you're still pretty busy. That's a four hour commitment most days and weekends. You have meets sometimes, right? Correct. So you're still maybe as busy, like sometimes maybe even more, but it doesn't sound like it sounds like it's more energizing to you. It is because you had yeah. your priorities. You, you follow the thing that yeah, yeah lit you up. Right. It's you know it, as I said, it's it's more uplifting. Um, yeah. I find more more joy in it. Um, you know, not that it, like I'll say with Hellbender, like the joy came in when people finished. Like that's when the joy came. That was the moment. But the rest of it was just stress. Like it was it was a hard process. Uh, I didn't enjoy the stresses that came along with, you know, setting up the race and putting it together. 
which is hard. Like, you know, it's, it's, that should be, it should be, you know, fun and enjoyable, but uh, working with so many entities and trying to put it together was just really difficult and, you know, something that I, I really just <laughs> didn't enjoy that yeah. part of it. So um, having track and just really enjoying, you know, I would say probably, you know, 95% of everything I do with track, there's, you know, that 5% always, that's just like, all right, I could do without <laughs> that, but <laughs> I'll deal with it because the other 95% of this is just amazing. And you're still finding time to, I want listeners to hear this too, is like, you're still finding time to get the appropriate sleep, mm -hmm. seven, eight hours, basically every night plus the occasional nap. And yeah. I think that's a lot more than the average person gets. I don't know what the average person gets, but yeah. I always ask my clients and yeah. it's... Right. That's that would, that would be impressive if they hit what you're hitting. We, uh, something we track as well, um, you know, because it, it kind of alerts them. Like, you know, when I say, well, look back at your sleep pattern. Like, yeah. it's, you know, like that's probably why you're not feeling as great. You know, there's, I mean, there's other factors that contribute to it. But, you know, when, when we say like, all right, you just did this huge run. Look at the next night. You have four and a half hours sleep. You know, that's mm -hmm. probably why you feel the way you do. Um, so it, it's good to give them that visual you know, as part of their training log. So, you know, if, if you're not tracking your sleep, it's a good number just to kind of record. Um, and sometimes like with, you mentioned like Garmin, I know Garmin, like it uploads, um, you know, your, your sleep patterns um, mm -hmm. to the app itself. And then with training peaks, it uploads those metrics right up to, to training peaks. So we can see that in their metrics. And then my Koros wears, my Sunto wears, um, I just have them look at their app and kind of just give me a, a ballpark of to, you know, what, what was the overall sleep? So you're using Koros and Sunto in tandem with each other? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm just, just saying in the, the, the multiple users, like my athletes that, Your athletes yeah, are. they may use, you know, various watches. So um, the Sunto and um, Koros don't upload automatically like the Garmin does. The Garmin will upload your metrics. Okay. Apple Watch does too. Um, but um, it, I, and like I said, I use, I use training peaks and that's, Again, why I don't use Strava as frequently because my stuff goes to Training Peaks as well, and I can record stuff in, mm -hmm. in Training Peaks myself. Um, just another platform, you know, another way to do things. I mean, I know people that I had athletes that are like, I just write it down. I'm like, all right, well, just take a picture with your phone and send it to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the good old days of the paper log. Yeah, yeah. Do you hold on to those? Do you have some from? ABC oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I still have all mine from yep. from you know high school and. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, my coach gave me my college training logs which is cool so cool yeah, yeah. uh do you ever look back at them and just like kind of pick a run from 20 years ago and see if you remember it and like you actually remember yeah it's yeah. really crazy right yeah. yeah and it's like trying to find a run that you don't remember is kind of hard it's, yeah. yeah but you can't like actively pick them out but they really do stick in your mind even just like normal runs yeah uh it kind of it enriches <laughs> your life so much you it know? does so what would you say to one of your clients if, if someone came to you and you asked them about their sleep and their training and they just said that well I get you know six hours some nights and it's like five six and they say that they just don't have time because they're a kid and no, they have kids not their kids <laughs> and uh and they work a lot etc cetera, etc cetera. and there's like the list of the reasons why they can't yeah. but you know, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. Yeah. I can appreciate people are busy, but it's like where your priorities go. So you, you've shifted your priorities in order I to have. be able to have that energy. Yeah. Um, but but I, what's what's like an initial approach that you take with someone who brings that up? What kind of yeah, digging would you do to find? Yeah, um, I had to simplify. And that's, I use myself as an example as to how can you simplify your life? What is the things that you're doing that take up time that really don't need to? And a lot of times that's like um, browsing on social media, watching television. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it, these, I know they're, they're great because it's that downtime in your day. We all need that downtime, but like how much is that really taking up? And is that taking up enough time that you, it could be detracting from your sleep? Mm -hmm. uh, and are you doing it right before bed? You know, so you're, you've got a deadly combination right there, right? You're on a, yeah. a, you know, a blue light device right before bed. So, you know, thinking about these things and what can you cut out? What are things that, you know, can add to your sleep, right? So um, just being more efficient with your time is that's what we look at is, you know, what are those extra things? Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, like before bed, I think a vast majority of people, myself included, I get sucked into this is like, you're just on a screen. Mm -hmm. And there's often times where I'll just turn my phone off. Mm -hmm. And even if like the TV's on or something, at least it's far away and you're not really, it's not hyper stimulating. You can yeah. turn it off. 
but trying to do something that is like relaxing at night like i'll play a piano or read or journal mm-hmm. and i'll tell myself i want to do that and oftentimes successful but sometimes it just feels like it do- that doesn't sound fun it kind of like mm-hmm. the other one it's like just a little bit and you tell yourself oh i just got to check this metric i just got to check whatever <laughs> and then you're like sucked into it so uh how far back do you rewind that in your day in order to be successful going to bed at 10 o'clock when do you start yeah. changing so, things? yeah so um my um my day is is pretty laid out ahead of time like i you know i'm, I'm really meticulous about like what I'm doing and when I have time to do it. What do I need to accomplish? Um, so I look at what needs to be accomplished, set that out for my day, and set my intention to get it all done. And then I fill in and say, okay, you know, I've got a break here. What am I going to do with that time? And then so during that time, that's my my downtime. I may take my dog for a walk. Um, that may be a time I check social media. Um, but having that daily kind of structure it really helps me and a lot of times my runners say well i just didn't know when i could fit in my strength training right Mm -hmm. and that's i say well you have to set the intention right there's got to be the intention to do it and you have to know when you have the time to do it so if you're looking at your day and you're setting it up you know look at what is mandatory right like time with your kids right time to work right so you've got all of that and then you say okay now i need to fit in my run where's the run gonna go that's you know next priority usually Mm -hmm. and then okay now what where do i have time to strength train and you know i always tell my runners it it may be that you have to break up the strength session and and do a piece in the morning and a piece in the afternoon or a piece in the evening you know just do it when you have time like don't feel that it has to be one sit down session i'm not trying to give you a hit workout right like we're not doing a high intensity interval session here with with strength training is let's just get it in when we can um or you know let's move it (laughs) if today is not the best day let's let's move it so um i want to give my my runners i tell them you know your schedule is not concrete right like I, i had one yesterday that was like my, you know, I, I just, today wasn't the day for this workout. And I said, that's cool. We call the audible. Let's move it. Let's, you know, let's put it somewhere else. Um, and sometimes that's tough. You know, I, I had one the other day that was like, Hey, can we move this run somewhere? And I was like, well, based on your week, uh, we can't let's, you know, this isn't a vital run, right. you know, know that you're okay. If, if we don't get this run in, let's just keep moving forward with the schedule. Cause I don't want you to be stressed about trying to fit this in when it's just not going to work for your week. So, you know, having those conversations, I think it puts them at ease a little bit more because I think a lot of runners get hung up on that. Like, oh my God, I didn't get this in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if we're doing that consistently over time, then something has to change. But if it's just once, you know, every four or five weeks, that's not the biggest thing. You know, it's not the worst thing. Even if it's just like a long run, you know, like, like missing one long run, because something came up, not the worst thing in the history of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Based on their week. Based on their week. That's why, you know, like a template, a cookie cutter plan, uh, you know, doesn't account for that. And uh, it depends on like the priority, right? So if the priority is number one, then screw everything else and you get it done. And there's this thing, there's like this mindset that I don't think a lot of runners really feel good about or like adapt long term but it's just like in the culture i call it rocky mindset Mm. where it's like push hard and just grind and just get it done and uh and we believe oftentimes i think that when it comes to it we can grind it out hard and we can push hard but if that's the the tool that we use to get the training done then what about the other things in your life it's like but i'm supposed to be grinding but like grinding with what? Is this what you want? If it doesn't lift you up, then it's going to just crash. You're going to plateau. You're going to get injured. Something's going to yeah, happen. Sure. So shifting that focus to like, you're not a runner. You're a person who runs and you've got to like in that hierarchy, um, know kind of what the priorities are. Yeah, so when you said, when you start like for your day, uh, you set an intention and you know, what's mandatory. And then I'm not sure how much of it is scheduled, but I'm curious with your downtime, mm-hmm. you're choosing a block of time that is for downtime and you can allow yourself to whatever, mm-hmm. derp on social media as long as you want, yeah. you're like in that time. So you like give yourself permission to. Yep. And does that take the, the pressure off or like the guilt off? Like if, if someone were scrolling for hours and hours but didn't doesn't want to, it's like this downward energy. Yeah. But if you allow yourself to for a finite period of time, yep. it takes the pressure. It does, yeah. 
you know, I, like I set, um, I set a notepad next to my bed. Um, Bart Smith gave me this tip because um, I constantly, my mind was whirling at this one point and in time, and I was, um, my mind just constantly wanted to think about things that I had to do, and I, I was getting restless at night. I was, it was disrupting <clears throat> my sleep because I constantly woke up like, oh, what about this, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I put this notepad next to my bed and it allowed me to write things down if I thought about something, you know, like I could just jot it, a note down just so I'd remember. And then my, my mind would be at peace. And I'll tell you over time, I've had to write less and less because I've, I'm, I'm becoming better at knowing, you know, during my daytime things that I need to do. And if I, you know, I can write those down during the day rather than worrying about them at night. Yeah. So when I go to bed, um, my mind can stay at, at ease because I know, I've, you know, I mean, there's every, you know, every once in a while something's going to pop up and I'll have to write a note just because like, oh, I forgot about this, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for the most part, it's, you know, it, that's, I have used my phone. I use notepads, you know, I, like I really want to make sure that my mind can stay at peace at night. Mm-hmm. Um, cause that's, I think a lot of the times what disrupts us is that our minds are still engaged. Just, yeah. It's going, constantly going, going, going because we're not allowing it to rest because we're putting it in this like stimulated state that like, Oh my God, I got to get this done. Whereas if you write it down and then you're like, all right, it's written down. I, you know, I don't have to think about that right now and I'm not going to do it right now. That's for sure. I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, allowing yourself that and recognizing that when you write things down, you'll remember and you'll get to it, but you just got to figure out when. And that's, you know, when I set my intentions, I'd be like, all right, today's the day I got to fit that in, you know, like from my honey to-do list, right? Like yep. my daughter's like, you got to move my shelf. And I'm like, I know I do. Yes, sweetie, I have it on the list. It will get done on Saturday when dad has time. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, but you know, it's everything in its place and everything in its time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, that's, it took a long time to come to that and be okay with it. And not just like, you know, everything has to be done today. <laughs> At there, for a long time that's what yeah. it felt like yeah. is like everything had to get done today so I feel like I can relax mm-hmm. but there's always something to do it never ends it, it never does not <laughs> so I had to recognize that you yeah. know and, and come to terms with the fact that not everything can get done today um, and once I did then I was much more at peace um, much more relaxed uh, so you know it's uh, it's finding your priorities and recognizing what isn't on fire <laughs> what doesn't need to be put out right now you yeah know? And that, that's, that's taken a long time to recognize. There's this idea of there's four categories of tasks that we can do, and they're either urgent or not urgent. House is on fire, urgent. You know, Checking Facebook, not urgent. And there's things that are important and not important, like time with your family versus whatever. Sure. And then the cross-section of all those. So there's like four. And without capturing things and writing them down, it's really easy to let the things that are uh, not important but urgent, that's like the category that will rob you of, of your time, but, but that energy. Because if it feels urgent, you're like <laughs> stimulated, hard to sleep. I got to do this. And I didn't, these small things, but they're not really important. And by like capturing them, uh, I use the term capture because um, there's this course uh, that I took a couple years ago from Tony Robbins, which was great. It was, it's called Time of Your Life. Okay. And it teaches you how to basically do what you're talking about here. Um, Take all of the things that you want to do in your life in the different categories and how to actually like get them done so you're not dying and you're doing the things that are important. And there's this thing called the capture list, which you can use for the day or the week. I have a, a weekly capture. So like on the weekend when I'm with my girlfriend, uh, I just got this piece of paper that I start writing down just as you said, when th- something comes up for work, instead of talking about it incessantly, which sometimes I still do. <laughs> Sorry, Anna. Um, <laughs> just write it down. And then Monday, when Monday comes around, I've got this list and it's like personal things, maintenance of the house, running goals, client things. And it's like everything, all mm-hmm. this discombobulated, but I don't have to worry about what were those 10 things I thought right. about. It's just all right there. Yeah. And then, then you can just use that as a list to start checking things off. But the, there's like even more power in you, in doing what you said you do next is like knowing what the priorities are. So you can of course batch those things. Um, but then knowing what the main outcomes for different areas of your life. So those are like main outcome for running and for with clients and sure. administration. Yeah. And oh, wait, I, I, no matter how busy I am, relationship's still important too. So the relationship like date night or whatever it is gets put on there, even if it means all these other admin things that would be scrambling your brain don't get done. 
and like putting scheduling those, scheduling the time for those. And then what I found is like a lot of those other capture items, all the small things, you carry them over from day to day to day or week to week and keep writing them down and they never get done. And so it kind of shows that a lot of those things, they weren't really that important. Sure. And if you carry it over for week after week and you still didn't do it, but nobody died, it's kind of like <laughs> either do it or let yourself off the hook, get rid of it or, or even outsource it. Yeah. Let's go back to the, the Grand Slam and just talking like from a broad level, um, top level down, like 30,000 foot view, how has, you're very experienced as an ultra runner, you've been at this a long time and you've done some, some major things. Um, how has this pursuit just changed you just internally about how you view sure. this life running? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because, you know, having a, a competitive background, I didn't want that to be a piece of this. Like there was, there's, there's the goal of finishing it obviously, which is a competitive piece, but I didn't want my, um, my history with running to become too obsessive <laughs> in in this process um, because I wanted to enjoy it you know like and if I went into each race being like oh I need to run this time you know like I just felt that was going to diminish the experience and who knows if I'll experience any of these races ever again and so I wanted to you know just really take that opportunity and just step back and say let's enjoy this and that's you know the way I approached Western States as I said earlier um, uh, you know, would I have liked to have run sub 24 and got that silver buckle? Of course, that would have been awesome, but that wasn't the day I had. And like, I knew that going into it, that there was the possibility that that wouldn't happen. I recognized it. And when the time came, I was okay with it because I had recognized that fact. Mm -hmm. Um, when Badger came along and I was in like, I was in like seventh place overall and I was moving up and I was like, do I need to be moving up with Leadville three weeks away? And the answer was no. <laughs> I didn't yeah. need to be moving wow. up. You know, so I just realized that and I was like, back off. That's okay. We're not here for the purpose of getting, you know, into the top five, into the top three. That's not what my intentions are. Mm -hmm. um, and then with Leadville, you know, obviously I talked about like trying to get the sub 25 buckle. Again, like if I had the day, that would have been great. But, you know, like when I went up Hope Pass, I quickly realized like it would take a lot to, to stay on that pace. And I was like, that's not what I need to do to get to Wasatch healthy and ready to run. Mm -hmm. um, so just staying present in each race was something that was, you know, I really had to be cognizant of recognizing, you know, there is another race behind it. And that's really hard, like because you want to be present in each race, but you also <laughs> have to remember that there's one to follow. Um, now Wasatch being the last race, the you know the goal is to finish. There there are all these really cool buckles for different times and stuff like that. But yeah. again, the intention is you know finish, get to the finish, um, whatever that takes. And that's you know that's that's a, that's a new intention for me is you know just finishing. Whereas you know in the in the past I, I will say like you know UTMB, um, Hard Rock, the goal was just to finish. Um, it's I think as I've gotten older I've become better at saying it's okay just to finish this it's you know like when we were in mile 200 of bigfoot <laughs> and morgan said to me he's like 10th place is right in front of you i said that's nice <laughs> you know yeah. as uh he's like dude if we can just throw down some 10 30s you'll catch 10th place and i said 11 30s is all my body got man like i told you i just want to finish this thing you know it's it's uh, like I recognized that 1030 was just it was too much, you know, like I was pushing myself too much and it was, you know, it wasn't the right thing to do. <coughs> so as I've gotten older, I think I just got wiser about, you know, what my body has and what I can do um, and not over pushing it so that like I can enjoy, you know, the next few days with my family and, mm -hmm. and not be totally trashed and worn out and, uh, you know, worse human being and worse father. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um I, but I've grown to enjoy it more that way. Like I really am enjoying the process. I'm enjoying each race. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to Wasatch. Like I'm looking forward to being out there and, and sharing time on the trail with you know my fellow competitors and with my my pacers. Um, you know, it's 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 just it brings me great joy just to to do it. And I think the biggest thing I found was that when we strip it down, um, like all the way down to the nitty gritty you know when i strip it down to where i sat at winfield halfway through leadville and i was just 
kind of in despair, like, like, what am I going to do to get myself out of this? I recognized that, you know, at the bottom of it, it's just love, like all about love. Like, um, you know, when, when debt hit, uh, and when I said, I got to pay my debts, it was, you know, the love, not only for, for running, but for my family, for my friends. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not just doing this for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm doing it for a bunch of others. I love this sport. You know, I love doing it. I love running. I love being out here. I love the outdoors. Um, you know, but I really, truly, I love my family and, you know, the, the things that it shows them, the possibilities and the way it makes them feel too. Like their, their pride in me and their joy for what I do, you know, their celebrations of it as well. Um, so it's, you know, it, that's what really struck me was, uh, was that, you know, the feeling of the, you know, that I get from running and from what it brings. Mm-hmm. But what about the time on the clock? <laughs> uh, th- this is amazing. I want to dive deeper in with this because uh, I just love this. Um, you said that you're looking forward to Wasatch. Mm-hmm. And there's this this feeling that we get as runners sometimes that you finish a really hard race and you get that, that thought um, that I'm never, why do I do this? And I'm never doing this again. And uh, that kind of, diminishes I think over time if you stay in it but it's a common emotion that a lot of runners feel sure. it's like you question why you're doing this and when you finish the race even if you did well you're definitely not looking forward to the next one mm-hmm. at least in some fraction of the population and you just finished doing something really difficult like maybe the most difficult one thus far sure and you're looking forward to the next one mm-hmm. but had you been like going for the time even if you hit the time uh, it w- it, who knows it, but it would probably sure. be a different game. Yeah. So like tapping into the love is what gets you to look forward to the next one. And that is what get, what gets you to do this grand slam, mm-hmm. right? No, totally. If you lost touch with that. Uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 exactly it's just right. four races otherwise. But when it's, right. when you're like expanding yourself, yeah. so like tapping it's, into that emotion right. is. Yeah. yeah, it's it's the passion, right? It's the passion for the sport, the, the yeah. love of, of running, the love, as I said, of being outside, of just experiencing this, of the camaraderie that you gain from being with your fellow runners and seeing their struggles. Yeah. <clears throat> All of that. It's, you know, it's, it's so powerful. And when you recognize that and how much you love doing it, it, it becomes a different piece. It's, um, uh, you know, it's I, I, for a long time. It was times I, I chased times. I chased marathon times. I chased, you know, mm-hmm. 50 mile times, whatever it was. Um, you know, that was, that was big, but at the heart of it, when I recognized that it was, I just love this sport. I love running. I love where it brings me. I love what I see. I love who I meet. I love, you know, the time I spend with people on the trail. Like, I love the places it takes my family and I, the experiences that we have outside of, you know, the races themselves. When they get to travel to Lake Tahoe and spend two weeks and have a blast and have experiences of a lifetime, my, you know, my father says to me all the time, you're just making these wonderful memories for your for your family and for yourself yeah um it's something you can't you know you can't replicate or take away or you know where else can you do that i mean yeah we go on family vacations and stuff but man i mean just the the memories that they have you know my my daughter she tells her friends all these stories and stuff like that and then they're oh my gosh you did this and that and (laughs) well maybe that was a little bit (laughs) blown up but it's cool to you know to share those experiences and my daughter meeting like Courtney DeWalter after she you know won Western States and, oh, yeah so cool. yeah so she got a picture wow. with her and it, it, like you can't you know like I said you just can't replicate or you yeah. know, take away those experiences and uh, yeah so recognizing just how much you love it and if you don't love it it's it makes it a lot harder you know mm-hmm. if this is just something that you're like I just want to check it off it makes it tough. Because when you get to that tough moment and you really have to go deep and decide, like, why am I moving forward? I mean, if you're just like trying to check a box, it's, it, I mean, that's, that's really tough. Like, yeah. you're going to have a hard time finding the reason to keep moving forward. Um, so really find that intrinsic value. Uh, you know, what's, what's it going to be that's going to keep you moving forward? And yeah, that's what, that's what got me going it was just, uh, I recognized, all right, man, like, it's, there's a lot more to this than just your your pain at the moment, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it's it's a tough place to come to, though. It really is. It, it's a it's a tough thing to recognize because some people don't love running, and I understand that. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you know, it's it's quite the powerful thing. And maybe you can find something else. You know, I mean, I was you know raising funds for the the Challenge Athlete Foundation at uh, at Leadville, and um, 
that was, you know, that was amazing. We talked about earlier, you know, seeing these amputees and stuff and mm-hmm. just incredible, incredible athletes, incredible people, incredible stories. You know, I, I had uh, a bracelet on from Olivia who um, got a wheelchair. She had spina bifida or she has spina bifida and they gave her a racing wheelchair, um, the Challenge Athlete Foundation. So that's that's where funds go. And when I recognized like what I was raising money for, that became huge as well. And just looking down at that little bracelet and I had her picture in my mind, it just, you know, it brought a smile on my face. Mm-hmm. Um, so these little things, you know, it's, it's, but it all comes back to love. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. I've found it and listening to your story here, it's, it sounds similar to a journey that I've been on with like racing track, racing on the road, and it is about the time. And there's other experience in there as well. Sure. But shifting to ultras seemed to be, I don't know which one came first, but in the ultra world, um, it's, I think that it's maybe easier to get more in touch, even more in touch, not that you can't the other ways, but even more in touch. And like being out in nature, having the crew, like when your family's there, the family support is nice, but it's not like critically important in a half marathon. Right. But out there, like it brings you closer together. <laughs> um, I got good goosebumps. As I said. <laughs> uh, so did you find that like transitioning into more serious ultras was when that, that shift of like, of your why into more of the love of like, was it, was birthed and then nurtured? You know, is that yeah, yeah. I, like um, because when I got into ultra, it was still about competing. Um, you know, I, I I really still wanted to be competitive, and um, but then as my family became more and more engaged with the process, with the races, and you know, being out there, um, it it did change a lot. You know, like it became like oh, I can't wait to get to the next aid station and see my kids or see my wife. You know, mm-hmm. like that was it became a different. Like, you know, it, it was at like first it was like, oh man, like I just got to get to that next aid station so I can do this, 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 and then keep going. Right. Like then it evolved to, oh, I just, you know, I can't wait to see my wife. I can't wait to see my kids, you know? And then, um, now it's just like, you know, uh, it's, it's just a cool experience anymore. You know, yeah. like, it, I mean, yeah, I'm still looking forward to seeing my family at the next aid station, but you know, it's, it's also like enjoying the journey, like enjoying the, the in-betweens. Cause I think sometimes I forgot about that, you know, when I was racing was just like taking in the scenery and, and enjoying the, the moment and being in the race and being grateful for the opportunity. Um, and that's something that's really kind of grown, um, more and more important to me is just, you know, expressing my gratuity and expressing my gratefulness for you know, all the blessings that I have and all the places I go and everything I see and just being grateful for that. Um, uh, it's 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 changed my mental process um, because instead of like being in the moment and thinking about you know oh my gosh like I'm only at mile whatever you know I think about wow look at this like you know it's, this is so you know it's so beautiful like I don't I don't think about the mileage anymore I, mm-hmm. I, I think about where I'm at and look around take a moment to to recognize yeah. like I'm in the middle of Wisconsin, (laughs) you know, like when on earth would I be in the middle of Wisconsin running through, you know, a (laughs) cornfield and just take the moment and and recognize that, you know, I've got this great opportunity that I've been afforded and I continue to do it. Um, and I just want to continue to do it. So that's, that's the big thing. It's like, you know, thinking about like, especially in the day in day out, like what's going to keep me going? Um, what do I got to do to keep myself healthy? Um, and so, yeah, it's it's changed. It's evolved a lot, you know. That's but it's taken a long time. <laughs> mm-hmm. How did that mindset of sort of like letting go of the competitiveness and being in the moment and not chasing the time as much, being aware of the time but not chasing it, and go to Leadville where you're trying to get off of Hope Pass mm. before nighttime, yeah. which means you got to be looking at the clock yeah. all the way up until then, which was the yeah. you know majority right. of the race, um, and those seem like they could conflict. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, um, I would say that you're right. Like the, the time it was, it was definitely like one of those things that everybody kept stressing, right? Like it was, it was all around you. You were surrounded by it, but I had to stay in my moment and recognize my needs at that time or else I wasn't going to continue. Right. Like 
what was going on? What was my body telling me? I had to recognize the signals that like, I think I'm a little bit dehydrated, you know, or I probably need some more electrolytes. I'll maybe I need some more calories, you know? So looking at all of the little system checks, right? Like going through and kind of making sure that helped me because I was like, I'm doing what I need to do to make sure that I get to the finish line rather than just saying like, Oh my God, what's my watch reading? Right? Like I was rather than that, I was looking at myself and saying, you know, are you doing what you need to stay on that? And, you know, just let my body take care of the rest because I was taking care of my body. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So having the goal and that goal is a time, a certain place on the course at a certain time, but like stepping behind that and knowing that the the way to accomplish that is by still taking care of oneself. Right. And that is the way to yep. run fast. Yep. And so it, rather than worrying about how fast I was going, I was worrying about, am I taking care of myself so that I can run? <laughs> how about the emotional component? So that's the system checks. Mm-hmm. But the way that you're feeling, um, also stepping behind the time on the clock yeah. and knowing that that is there, even for like a road marathon or something. But then stepping behind and doing the system checks, the checking in with mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. So that you can, you said of letting go, what did you say? Let go of the competitiveness and enjoy this. And that also being a key to not just enjoy it, but also that can be the key. I would say that it probably is the key to actually run fast. And it's kind of like letting go of running fast in order to run yeah. fast. Yeah. And, but once you let it go, it kind of like doesn't matter. Uh, but talk, can you talk yeah. about the emotional sure. component yeah. of the letting go? Um, this one was really tough because it was, um, you know, Beth wasn't going to be there, my wife. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so like that was, you know, that was a a huge piece that I had to really keep in check. Uh, I get, I get pretty emotional (laughs) when, uh, you know, I think about my, my wife and my kids. Um, that's, that's a really huge emotional draw for me. So I really had to keep that in check and remind myself because a lot of times people feel guilty when they're away from their families. You know, they're like, I'm taking time away from my families. Mm -hmm. Beth always gives me the okay she says, you know, I don't want you to get upset. Like we are okay. We want you there. You know, we want you to do this. We're all cheering for you, which in turn uh, gives me the right away to say, let's, let's go and race. Let's go do this. If I didn't have that support, I probably would have a lot harder time with finishing, Mm -hmm. especially when it got hard because I wouldn't feel that support. But knowing that I have, my kids are behind me, you know, they're like, go, go finish this dad, like, you know, get this done. Um, and especially having my wife's support, like those are critical, you know, to, to my emotional state. So that's yeah. the foundation, you know, having that ability to know that I'm okay to be out there. I'm okay to be racing and taking this time, you know, errand time, if you will, because <laughs> yeah. it's not family time, obviously. Um, that's, that really does help me. And then you know, keeping my emotions in check, um, you know, it, it gets difficult, obviously, at times. Like I said, at, uh, at, at Winfield, that was my most emotional. I was definitely, like, I was really hard. I was looking around at everybody else, and they're in a really bad state. It was the most drops they ever had at that aid station. There were so many people that were pulled because of altitude sickness, mm-hmm. um, dehydration. Um, so it was a really big year for, for people going down there. And at the aid station, everybody was sitting in chairs, cramping, just, you know, ugh, just moaning, you know, just like you heard a lot of people just talking negative. And I was, yeah. and that's yeah. when I thought like, this isn't going to be good. Like emotionally, physically, like I'm not in a good place right here. Like I'm, you know, there's too much negative negativity surrounding me. Yeah. And that's when I recognized I got to move. I got to go like, this is time to move. And that's when you know I thought about that, that statement. And, and so it took me a little while to collect myself. Uh, getting out of that aid station and going back up to Hope Pass, it, it wasn't like things turned around quick. I was really still struggling physically, mentally, you know, emotionally. I was still, I was, I was taxed, you know, because I had really had to drew, draw a lot from myself to get back going and get back up. And people started, you know, like there were some people that ran right out of there. And I was just like, that's not what I can do right now. You know, I want to. But it wasn't physically possible. My legs weren't there. And I, I recognized that. And I was like, mm-hmm. but what do I need to do? Like, I did everything I needed to do at that aid station. But what do I need to do right now so that I can get back to moving and yeah. can get back to feeling yeah. better? And so, I, you know, I, I just, again, went through myself and took care of those things. And then 
because I took care of myself, my emotional state started to come back around. I started to feel more comfortable and, and be like, I can do this. I can get back up. I can, I can get back up to hope pass. I, you know, I feel stronger. And then all of a sudden I was like, okay, let's jog. And I was running and I was like, Oh, uh, you know, I'm able to run at, you know, these grades that I wasn't able to run at earlier. Yeah. My legs are coming back around and that's what really spurred everything, you know, physically, emotionally. I was just, you know, another 180. I won't say it was the last one, <laughs> but it, you know, it was it was definitely a 180 for every piece of me. Yeah. It all came together, you know, as emotionally, physically, everything turned around, and I was able to get going and get back up, hope pass. Um, but yeah, it, it it took a lot, and it was just kind of recognizing where I was and not trying to force anything um, because forcing it wasn't going to help. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this, this saying that I think is from Jim Rohn that says, stand guard at the door of your mind. Mm. And just because there are things happening around you, like maybe your runners who are really struggling, but being really like the struggle is different from the negativity. That's, I would say, even a choice. And standing guard at the door of your mind means like, what are you going to allow into your psyche? Because yeah. that we can control that. Maybe you can't even control the leg cramp or the course or whatever, sure. but we can control that. And your decision to sort of not allow those things into your psyche when you find yourself surrounded by that. Um, it's like asking yourself, what do I need to do? But it's like, what do I need to also not allow in? Yeah. You know, to just cultivate that centeredness so that you can keep going. And like when you lose that, that's when you can get in that downward spiral and the self-talk. Yeah. But when you stand guard at the door of your mind, it's like no matter what happens, you can, there's a belief that I found very useful that everything is always happening for me. Um, so even if you were hurt or thrown up or whatever, it's like, well, at least I'm thrown up. I weigh a, a pound lighter. That's two <laughs> seconds per mile per pound. Yeah, I'll finish faster. It's like just finding it. And not just like pretending that you find it, but actually cultivating the, the internal state of what is this experience to me? Yeah. And sometimes that does mean uh, like a letting go. And... It's, it seems amazing to me in a race how pervasive the, that those thoughts can kind of be. One of my clients spoke to me yesterday, and she had just run a PR in the half marathon. And uh, there was one of her, her, like, her friends who's like a, a, a rival, I guess. Um, she always thought of this other girl as being much faster than her because she was. And at mile, whatever it was, seven or something like that, she caught up to this girl, and she was had all this negative talk, like complaining about this and... I hate running and I think a lot of runners do this like in they think it's in jest not in jest but like in yes <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so my client she she ran by she ended up finishing like well ahead of her uh, because she said when she heard that she knew that that wasn't for her that she couldn't run with her mm -hmm. and like God bless her but she's in her own space yeah. and I need to cultivate right. this, this good feeling and the result was that she ran a really great race. Sometimes the result might not be. You might blow up whatever, but sure. it like it is the way to the fulfillment because time yeah. on the clock or not, she was very excited about it, <laughs> um, that she had done so well and cultivated. She, wasn't ex she was kind of excited in a token way that she had beat her friend, um, but mostly about who she had become in order to be able to do that. And... And, and cultivating that that focus, I think, is a very high totally. level yeah. thing to do. Yeah, you got to recognize negative space. Um, I was it was early in the race, and I was um, I was kind of in the Congo line. We were going around Lake Turquoise, which is very early on in the race, yep. and um, there was there was a runner that pulled out poles like super early, and that was not very cognizant of where the poles were going, which was putting me in a negative space because I was more concerned about the poles and this runner than, you know, what was going on around me, um, or myself for that matter. <laughs> so, um, I recognized that I was like, this guy is putting me in a negative space. I'm not liking the way my emotions are right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so I removed myself from that situation. I, like I stopped and went to the bathroom <laughs> and let him get ahead. You know, I yeah. caught him again at the aid station and then you know, I, I, it was a nice section. I just ran, mm -hmm. got my space from this runner and never saw the runner again. But it removed myself from that situation because I, I recognized that I was starting to gain negative emotions. And I was like, I don't like this headspace, especially mm -hmm. this early on mm -hmm. in the race. So, yeah, just recognizing what you're feeling at the moment and, you know, t removing yourself from that situation, however you need to do it. 
I think that's, you know, that's something you have to get better at because mm-hmm. if you stay in that space, it just starts to, like you said, spiral. Yeah. And there's two ways to get away from it. You could drop back or you could sprint ahead. Right. Yep. And uh, I've tried both with myself. And the problem is with with getting ahead and leaving that person behind and like, oh, shit, if I can't maintain this, you're kind of worried that they're going to catch you again and you're going to be pissed right, off again. Right. And so there's even a blessing in this that by letting them go, it's like you're also more likely to like move towards a negative split, like be more conservative with your pacing. And that when you, if something keep something in the bank so that if something does come up later on, you have the ability to run away from it. Mm-hmm. And um, that choice between either dropping back or going ahead is an interesting one. I think it takes maybe experience or discipline or just self knowledge yeah. to choose the dropping back one. Right. Because it feels better to like be higher up. Oh, it does. Right. It does. I was so early in that race, I really wasn't too concerned with you know <laughs> losing a few <laughs> seconds or minutes, you know. But like, yeah. it, it was also a time to relieve myself, so <laughs> it worked out well. It worked out well. Yeah. <laughs> See, everything's working out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's close off here with just looking forward into. Um, what you're going to do when you're wrapping up, it's, it, it honestly sounds like you've got the, everything that you're, you've set out to get. It's like you've already accomplished before the end of the thing is done. And it's this really cool script flip where oftentimes we think we need to get something in order to feel something. And it's not just in running, right? With relationships, finance, spiritual development, whatever. Sure. If I have this, if I get the million dollars, if I get the pretty growth, like whatever it is, <laughs> it's like then, if, if this happens, then I'll feel a certain way. And you've already, like the feelings that you're after, you're already experiencing them yeah. in the races and along the way. Yeah. So it's like the, when, when you get to the, your fourth finish line, it, it almost like doesn't matter because you've become, you have the feelings. Because if the outcome is to run those races so that you can be whatever, accomplished and uh, all these things, right? But you already have that. So what happens from here? Like, are you, this is already a success when it's done? Um, it gets kind of like open. Where does it go? Well, so I think part of it is that like any way which way it goes, any which way it goes, uh, you know, if, if I had a DNF, God forbid, at, at Wasatch, I'd be okay with that. Like, uh, like some people say that, you know, but I recognize it's a possibility. Like that mm-hmm. can happen, and it's I have to be okay with that too. I mean, yeah, I'd be upset, of course. There's no, you know, that's human nature. But like, it's a possibility. So you know, recognizing that there is possibility for success and failure is part of this. You know, like you have to understand that there's it can go either way. Um, but that said, like, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I can have the most successful day, right? Like I'm doing everything I can to control the controllables. And if something uncontrollable happened, then, you know, I have to either try to address it or, you know, accept the consequence. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when I look at this, um, it's not, um, it's not to say that I am successful or unsuccessful if I finish, like that's part of it too. Like I am happy that I had the opportunity. Like not a lot of people have this opportunity to be able to do a grand slam. Like, you know, it, it takes a lot you know, like time commitment, finances, you know, there's all the logistics of it. It's really challenging. So like I have to recognize that too. I mean, as we talked about earlier, there's only six of us left at the 17 that started. Yeah. It's hard. Like that's part of it, right? That's part of the challenge and accepting that challenge and recognizing along the way, like, oh my gosh, I've, I've done so many cool things already. So, I mean, you know, three out of these four races, it's like, I mean, I've I've already done some amazing races. And again, just going back to being grateful and just saying, like, I'm grateful for all of that and saying I'm grateful for the next opportunity. And just, you know, going into the race saying, okay, like, I'm I'm here, I'm I'm in the moment and just staying there, right? Like, if if I'm in mile one, that's, I'm not thinking about mile two. Like I'm in mile one and mm-hmm. I have to say, like, let's get through mile one. <laughs> mm-hmm. So just taking it step by step, just as we do in life, right? Take it step by step and keep moving forward. Um, you know, just do everything you can to make sure that it's, you're going to stay positive, right? Uh, like what's, what's detracting from you at the moment? Just like we just talked about, what are the negatives? Like what, what's, what's bothering you? You know, how can you get out of that? What do you need to do to stay into that that positive and that positive frame of mind? And what do you need to do to keep moving forward? 
right? Like it's, it's not asking why, it's asking what, what do I need? Not why am I doing this? <laughs> that should have been established a long time ago, mm-hmm. right? Like when mm-hmm. people ask like, why am I doing this? That should have been answered a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just ask, what do you need at that moment, right? Like Asking a better question. Asking a better and question. And that shifts your mind. Yep. Why am I here? Why does this suck so bad? Yeah. What can I be grateful for? Right. Just like the question you ask yourself brings yes. it in. It does. It, it frames it. Yep. Wow. Um, fantastic way to end this. Um, the last things that you just said about um, being in gratitude and being present to the moment and tapping into love and staying positive. It's like these things, you hear these in every walk of life where someone is very, not just successful, but fulfilled. And there's a major difference. Uh, but being having success and fulfillment, these are like common things. And you've like tapped into this very well. Um, Thanks, man. So <laughs> thank you for sharing your journey with us. Um, it's inspiring. I love so much, like honestly, that you, you uh, have become this kind of person that I know you. It's, it's like, it's not, it's for so much more than, it's the art of running. It's the fulfillment through running. And I think that if we made it to the end of our life, being very successful, but not being, being fulfilled, that seems like a failure, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so focusing on this fulfillment is not easy to do because sometimes you have to let go of the, the things that the mind wants. And um, it's inspiring to hear your story. Thank you. Thanks, Thank man. you so much. Thanks. Would you like to uh, share your where people can find you? Oh, uh, sure. I'll follow you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find me on Facebook, um, Instagram. Just look, Aaron Saft. Um, that's my socials. I'm on Strava. Um, if you want to follow along, ask questions. A lot of people ask me, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, my website is um, runningislife.run. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, yeah it's, you can follow along on my podcast, too, Running Is Life podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you so much. Absolutely, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. I hope that you really enjoyed that interview. And if you want to hear the second part of this interview, this was actually two part. He had me on his channel about two months ago and he's asking me about my philosophy on running, on coaching and personal development. I think you're really going to like it. And you can find the link for that in the show notes below in the description. Oh my goodness. I have so many of you on here to thank for how well the Run Elite book is doing already. We are number one on Amazon for running and jogging and number one in track and field as well. It's doing super well. Uh, We have five star reviews across the board and they just keep coming in and keep coming in every day. And I see that there's more reviews popping up. And thank you, thank you so much if you're one of our readers who's got the book and left us an awesome review. But if you haven't yet, go ahead and pick up your copy, Run Elite. Um, It's on Amazon right now, it's on Audible right now. Train and think like the greatest runners of all time. Now, we have the great marathoner, Bill Rogers, who has endorsed the book as well. And uh, you're gonna learn three things basically. You're gonna learn the elite mindset, and then you're gonna learn how to structure your training every step of the way, including uh, some bonuses, including a pace calculator for all your training paces. And then you have special hacks that the US military, the NBA, and the NFL are using to increase endurance in as little as six days. So go ahead and pick up a copy of the book. And thank you so much for being a member of our group here and um, watching our videos. If it weren't for you guys, we wouldn't even need this. So take care and thank you for making it a success.